You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 85 of the Common Descent Podcast. Wait, this one ends in a five. It does end in a five, and you know what that means. The next one ends in a six. This one is an extinction episode. Yes. So we have this tradition where episodes that end in five are extinction episodes. This time we are talking about the oldest of the famed big five Phanerozoic mass extinctions, the Ordovician mass extinction. And the the final of the big five that we've talked about. This is it. We did, we've done the other four of the big five. We've done a bunch of other extinction topics. So following in the same trajectory as those, we will talk about what the extinction was, what suffered, what probably or maybe happened to cause it, mm-hmm. and the legacy that it left behind. The aftermath. The aftermath. That is the last section on my notes. It is called <laughs> Aftermath. This episode was requested by Rita, one of our patrons, by Loeli, and way back in our March 2018 survey, (laughs) some anonymous person requested that we do all the big five. Yep, yep. Anonymous person, this is it. (laughs) It has taken us three years. We have finally (laughs) fulfilled your request. Three years and five. Five episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's been two years since the request was made. <laughs> but before we get into that episode, but before we get into the discussion, a few announcements. We have a Patreon, mm-hmm. and we are supported by donations on our Patreon. And one of the many ways that we like to give back to our patrons is by saying their names for everybody to hear. If you subscribe at a certain level, we will thank you. And this episode, we have a list. <laughs> thank you and welcome to Tim, Frederick, Damiano, Jason, and Stephanie. Stephanie is uh, one who has followed us for a very long time on Twitter and the like, and so happy to finally have you as a patron. Yes, thank you everyone, and welcome. Patreon is full of all sorts of goodies, especially these days, because we have been producing a bunch of extra stuff lately. We are stuck at home, as are many of our listeners, and so we have been using this time to you know, hang out, watch movies and stuff. Yeah. Also to do extra recordings, create some bonus content to hopefully fill your time that you're stuck at home with some entertaining educational things. We have been doing Netflix viewing parties online with some of our listeners. Which have been tons of fun. Which we will continue to do more things like that, so keep an eye on our social media. Spawning off of some of those, we have done a brand new series of Silver Screen Science. We've done four episodes, and I think we're done for now. Yes. They have been Tremors, Evolution, 2001, Godzilla, 1998 this time, and by the time this episode comes out, we will have uploaded a very strange (laughs) uh, episode about the animals of the James Bond franchise. Yes, which we were watching anyway and sparked an idea. And then there were crocs and snakes, and they went, (laughs) all right, I guess we'll do an episode about it. And for our patrons, each of those Silver Screen Science episodes has a more thoughts that we put on Patreon. We've released after chats for some recent guest episodes, including Laura's from the last episode, 84. We put up bonus news, so there's all sorts of cool extra stuff up on the Patreon. And we'll keep doing more bonusy things, Mm -hmm. because it doesn't look like we're leaving the house anytime soon. Nope. So if there's stuff you'd like to see us do more of... Stuff you'd like to see us continue, stuff you'd like to see us bring back, let us know. Yeah, please. We are we are searching for ideas, and we would love to have your input. As always, we're open to suggestions. And as always, we hope that all of our listeners are staying safe and healthy and, and em- emotionally <laughs> yeah. okay and sane, and sane uh, during these particularly difficult trying times. We are rooting for you yes take care out there everyone and to distract you from your troubles for approximately an hour and a half let's talk uh first about the news news every episode we pull some news from the world of science because it's still happening despite the pandemic 
And we talk about it here on the podcast. Biology stuff, geology stuff, evolutiony stuff, stuff we like, stuff we think you'd like, keeps everybody up to date. This time, Will. I thought I'd pick some news that would be very uplifting. And so I picked a topic that couldn't help but make everyone feel better. So Crocs. Naturally. Is the first news. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> this is some research about the body size dynamics of aquatic crocodiliform cousins and the, what patterns we've actually seen in these what were thought to be particularly large crocs okay so yeah All it's right. a it's a, a looking at when they move to the water what it actually what effects that actually had on their overall body size i'm intrigued let's learn so this is research by william geerty and Jonathan Payne in Evolution, and the press releases in Science Daily by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So, going back roughly 200 million years ago, we see a portion of the ancestors of crocodilians, the crocodiliforms, a portion of them move out into the ocean and stay there. Uh, we mentioned this briefly in our Crocs episode. Way back in episode two. Yeah, that there were marine Crocs. Not like today's saltwater Crocs that are just saltwater tolerant, but finned and flippered. We're likely not coming back to land often, if ever. One of the things that... One of the ideas that has been very popular about this move to the water is that it was a move away from the selective pressures of the land. That now gravity was not a restraint. So you could get bigger easier, and there wasn't the same competition. So now you had more access to food, and your territory had opened up. So it was this idea that they were kind of freeing themselves from the landlocked restrictions. Because on average, it seems that a lot of the marine crocs are bigger. Not saying that they're the biggest, but they are typically quite large. So... This was this idea that by removing those selective pressures, they were able to flourish and get big and successful. This study took a look at that age-old concept to see if that actually holds up and if that's actually what seems to have been happening with these marine crocs. And initial findings say, no, that's Ooh. not why we see the size trends with them that we do. So what the study did is it took a database of 264 species of crocodiliforms, those croc-like uh, uh, ancestors to crocodilians, or cousins of the ancestors, that include specimens going all the way back to the Triassic. So, huge group, and analyzed the trends of the, the body sizes and the features. And what they actually found is, though on average, the, the weights and sizes of the aquatic crocodiliforms seem to be typically larger than semi-aquatic or landlocked forms, their size range is smaller. So what that means is that on land, you could see some truly massive, or you know, land or shore, truly massive individuals and fairly small individuals. Out at sea, you were mostly only seeing large-ish to large individuals. Okay. So you weren't seeing species, or species is what I meant, but you weren't seeing species that ranged the same amount out in the ocean, and their upper size limit did not increase significantly. Okay, so they're not getting bigger at a maximum necessarily. They just tend to be on the larger side, but more restricted in how many different sizes they can be. And yeah, they're not diversifying into larger categories. They are only in the larger categories. Interesting. So what it seems is there's actually a restriction to their size. So they looked at what what is it about being bigger and being in the ocean that correlate? One of the initial old thoughts was that getting bigger lets you dive longer. You know, you are bigger, you have bigger lungs, you can stay underwater for longer. Okay, makes sense. Which makes absolute sense, except that other studies actually show that lung capacity scales almost one-to-one -one with body size. Which means that getting bigger does not actually really increase the breadth to body size. Okay, so you can hold more air, but you also need more yeah. air to fuel your body. Exactly. It's it's working basically the same. You will increase it to an extent, but not as much as people might think. Okay. So size isn't helping with dives as much, 
what they think it more likely was is due to the extra pressures, selective pressures that the ocean actually added to their lifestyle. Hmm. So instead of freeing them from pressures, it seems they actually gained new ones that restricted their size to only the larger categories. And the main one was temperature. Water steals heat, absorbs heat more quickly than air does, and tends to be cooler. Ah, and larger bodies hold on to heat better. So if you're a, potentially, there are some studies that suggest these ocean-going crocodiliforms may have been slightly or more warm-blooded, you know, more uh, 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 endothermic, keeping their own temperature. But if they are not, if they are maintaining the same temperature as their environment, like today's crocs, then this cold ocean serves as a problem because it means they really have one of two options. Get big, which means they will retain their heat more efficiently, or if they stay small, constantly return to the surface to sun themselves. And one of those is much, much more energy inefficient. So getting big is the survival strategy of choice. It seems that this this boom in their size success is actually them responding to the hazards of the ocean and not them suddenly becoming more successful than the other crocs they left behind. Yeah, when you said that the size range got restricted, that immediately sort of changed the way I was thinking about it and that it wasn't them achieving larger size it was them no losing smaller size is that they are needing larger size right they they lost the option of being small not gained new options of being big that's uh, that that's an interesting finding i like that because so often we think of moves evolutionary like habitat changes and stuff as we're escaping pressures but Anytime you change habitats, you are taking on new pressures, and that can change your your creatures in unexpected mm-hmm. ways. Well, that's a cool finding. I feel like the escaping pressures is kind of the the evolutionary greener pastures mentality. You know, surely, when you move from your old to a new habitat, you will you will reap the benefits. Right, the water's always warmer on the other <laughs> yes. side. This study also brought up two interesting points, which one. This suggests that not only marine crocs need to be bigger, but the lineages that evolved marine crocs could not have started small. Right. Ancestrally, they needed to be a certain size. So it actually reduces the lineages that could have given risen, given, given rise to these marine uh, lineages. Interesting. And this actually matches up very well with similar research on marine mammal studies, who are also face the same issues even though they're producing their own heat yeah now you're just producing heat that is also being stolen by the cold (laughs) so like this actually parallels with other marine organisms quite well well very cool yeah not bad for a croc study well speaking of strange aquatic triassic archosaurs my next study is about kind of canistrophids all right and if you don't know what those are stay tuned this is research by Tian de Oliveira et al. in PLOS One, and we'll link to an article at CNN by Ashley Strickland. In the Triassic, after the Permian mass extinction, see a uh, extinction trend going on here, <laughs> archosaurs and their cousins, you know, reptiles, diversified across the world. They started to take over, and you got your early croc cousins, you got your early dinosaur cousins. Well, one of the weirdest groups that popped out of this diversification was a group called the Tanistrophids. These were sort of lizard-bodied, and they tended to have long tails. They were sort of sprawling, and they had these really long necks. Mm-hmm. And they're super weird, and people have been mystified by them for a long time. Because a, a lizard-like body with a long neck is a weird thing to have. They are found rather widely so they were successful europe asia and north america oftentimes in marine sediments so it has been suggested that at least some of them were aquatic or semi-aquatic although that there's a whole bunch of discussion some of them are apparently terrestrial that's not what this study is about (laughs) it's animal the weird body form so we're going to argue about what it does (laughs) yes but this study is more about the mystery of their origins we don't have a good fossil record of the earliest tanistrophids, 
so we don't know very much about their origins and how they diversified. This study, I here the authors describe a new early Triassic archosauromorph that they identified as being a sister to the Tanistrophids. Ooh. Which means their closest relative. Not actually a Tanistrophid, but a close cousin from the time of their origins. So perhaps indicative of how they got started. The new specimen comes from the Sanga do Cabral formation in Brazil, which is an area that is known for temnospondyls, which are your big amphibians, early reptiles, but not until now for Tanistrophid-like things. The new specimen is a brand new genus and species, which they named Elisaurus gondwanoxidens. It is known from parts of the back legs, so leg, feet, the pelvis, the hips, and the tail. And it is inferred to have been a lot like other, you know, like Tanistrophids with these longer legs, which is what the new genus name is referring to. Elisaurus, Will will find this funny for reasons that our, <laughs> our podcast listeners will not be privy to, is from Elisar, which is a name that Aragorn takes <laughs> in Lord of the Rings, <laughs> and Aragorn is also known as Strider. Yeah. And since the new reptile had these long hind legs, <laughs> these nerds thought that that was a good excuse to name a new reptile after a Lord of the Rings character. <laughs> <laughs> What's notable about the legs and, and what else they can tell about its body shape and the habitat it's found in is that they're all consistent with a terrestrial lifestyle living on land. All right. If this animal is indicative of the ancestry of Tanistrophians, then that might suggest they started on land before moving into the water, like your crocs. The species name, Gondwanoxidens, means from West Gondwana. So we've talked about Gondwana before. That was the ancient amalgamation of the southern continents. Today, our southern continents, South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia. And that's a weird place to find a Tanistrophid-like reptile, because the rest are up in the north. Mm -hmm. So this suggests that perhaps part of the early diversification, maybe even the origins of Tanistrophids and their cousins, were in the southern continents. Which is a fascinating thing to know, because that might tell you where to look for more. Yeah, I, I always like when we have discoveries like this, where an animal... You know, or organism is known from one particular area and just has yet to be found somewhere else until we do. Yep. Because it's always, there's always a bit of common sense to it of like, just because you were finding them here doesn't mean this is where they came from. Like horses are always my favorite example of where they originated and where they are nowadays is not at all what you would expect it to be. Yeah. And I like when we find that out of like, oh, We've been looking in the wrong... We've been digging in the wrong spot. Right. And that's always fun to think about is, like, oh, well, we don't know anything about the origins of this group. It's like, oh, well, it might have happened in a different place. Mm -hmm. You need to be looking in South America. And that's always reassuring for me because it means that, the, that there's now potential that it's not that that portion of their evolution didn't fossilize well or, you know, almost at all, but that we've just been looking in the wrong spot for it yeah so hopefully we'll learn more about tanistrophid origins with more studies very cool we'll see all right well my next news deals with some ancient humans in africa oh specifically three species that seem to have occupied the same place at the same time oh in actually two different locations at two different times these are two studies in this news article. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Which I didn't know when I went into reading it and was very confused until I finally parsed everything out. The first study we're going to discuss is by Susan Anton in Science. And these, this article is from BBC News by Paul Rincon. So this is about a pair of skull caps. So part of the, the cranium from of two early humans found near Dremolin Cave in or near Johannesburg. And so two skull caps found in Africa. One was from a species called Paranthropus, which we've mentioned before, Paranthropus robustus. Yeah, episode 18, part, uh, the first part, 18A. The other 
was slightly more modern species, which appeared to be Homo erectus. Okay, 18b. Yeah, so both cool and both interesting. They were dated, which allowed them to very accurately date the site as well. And it came out that everything from this quarry, this this cave complex quarry, is between 2.04 to 1.95 million years old. Well, dating is cool. Right? <laughs> they were able to get very good dates. So two ancient hominids in the same place around the same time. Absolutely. And the third comes in that Australopithecus, which is one of the earlier uh, uh, cousins of us humans, potentially ancestor, was in that area during this tide, died out somewhere in that time, about two million years ago. So not at this site, but in that area was already known to be. And now this confirms that three species of human cousin were in the same pl- same area of Africa at the same time. Very cool. Which is bolstering that, you know, what is now a much more common idea that human lineage was not a line. It was a amalgamation of different, different humans that uh, only one succeeded to today. Right. After the mass extinction. <laughs> <laughs> this, though, also is the earliest example of Homo erectus anywhere in the world. Oh, yeah. That makes sense now that you mention it. Yeah. That's cool. So very old. Homo erectus, which is awesome, and the only one known from South Africa. So similar to your study, your news, beforehand, it was always assumed that they originated in Eastern Africa. This older specimen now suggests they may have originated in South Africa. So it's cool fossils, suggesting cool stuff with some really neat things for the Homo erectus. A second study that came out this same month (laughs) about different human uh, cousins in a different part of Africa. This is study by Grun et al. in Nature. So one in science and one in nature. Yeah. (laughs) The the one-two punch. And this one is in Zambia. Uh, This was a well-preserved skull from a quarry in Zambia that was dug up in like 1921. And they were dating it once again. And they had initially guessed that it was around 500,000 years old based on its anatomy. The skull had features more primitive, you know, more ancestral than us humans, but more derived than Homo erectus. So it seemed to be somewhere in between feature-wise. Okay, it, it fits in a particular place within that gradual shift of features. Exactly. So somewhere in that general part of the Venn diagram, which is what gave them the roughly... 500,000 years old based on those features. The dating brought out that it's actually much younger, between 324 and 276,000 years old. Okay. Much younger, which implies a few things. First, it implies that, once again, three different Homo species were coexisting in this area of Africa during this time. This one, which by most is believed to be the same species as Homo heidelbergensis, and then Homo naledi, and early members of Homo sapien, us. So once again, in a different part of Africa, but much younger, a dated skull reveals that, yeah, three now known species of here Homo, but previously Homo sapien cousins were occupying areas of Africa simultaneously. Yeah, that's that's interesting because it suggests that there was a long period of time during which you could expect to see multiple human or close to human species coexisting. Exactly. That it's not, it, it reminds me of, um, there was a study recently that actually this isn't published yet, but I, let's just say I was talking to a researcher who studies rabbits <laughs> and they were pointing out that in lots of different ecosystems and lots of different fossil sites, And today, you will often get two species of rabbits that are two different sizes in the same place. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that it happens today, it happens in the fossil record, you see it in all different places. This feels very similar where, you know, in the future we might end up saying, oh, no, no, for three million years or whatever, there were always, always three there are. Yes. Human hominin species coexisting at the same time. Well, and I like it because it, it really drives home this idea that to me at least that it was not this 
idea of the the failed attempts and the successful attempt you know we they were all we were all <laughs> coexisting for quite some time and then for whatever reason only homo sapien remains right like with like we say so often today is the weird version yes we are the weird ones and that's always fun to learn mm-hmm. well our last bit of news sticking with the theme is about mass extinction recovery specifically the recovery of lake environments after the permian mass extinction all right this is research by xiangdong zhao et al in the journal geology and we'll link to a press release on phys.org uh, by the chinese academy of sciences so the permian mass extinction maybe you've heard about it happened around 250 million years ago and it was real bad Ended the Paleozoic era, kickstarted the Mesozoic, and it took quite a while for global ecosystems to bounce back. Previous studies have suggested that ocean ecosystems seem to have taken about 8 to 10 million years to noticeably recover, to, to really substantially recover, and then throughout the rest of the Cretaceous, they were still sort of restoring previous levels of diversity. However, Freshwater environments, lake environments, are not as well known because there's just not a lot of documented remains of lakes from the early Triassic, so we don't know how they were doing in the wake of the extinction. This study finds lake sediments from the Middle Triassic in the Ordos Basin of China, and they were able to sample sediments, ash layers, and fossil remains to get an idea of what this lake looked like. The sediments were amongst the organic-rich shales in the Tungchuan Formation, which suggests at least some diversity of organisms. The ash layers allowed them to date the sediments to around 242 million years ago, so 10 years, so the Permian mass extinction is 252 to be specific, so we are 10 years after the mass extinction. This is significant because other Triassic lake remains only go back to about 5 million years later than this. So this is the oldest known Triassic lake ecosystem by 5 million years, closer to the Permian extinction than any others. Within the lake sediments, they found evidence of a deep perennial lake, which is to say deep waters, perennial meaning it's not like a, a that it doesn't dry up every year, mm -hmm. it's there year round for a very long time. Within the lake, they found fossil evidence of plants, algae, insects, ostracods, fish, fish coprolites, indicating a complex ecosystem. Yeah. yeah and a lake full of different trophic levels, different types of organisms, including, they noted, some key components of Mesozoic faunas. The ones they specifically mentioned were aquatic beetles and fly larvae. Hmm. That those are things we tend to see in Mesozoic freshwater environments. So we have evidence of a more or less thriving complex ecosystem in a lake 10 million years after the Permian mass extinction, which also lines up not only with the marine recovery numbers, but the end of what is known as the coal gap. Mm. So following the Permian mass extinction, there is a roughly 10 million year time span where we don't find coal. And since coal is formed by forest environments, you get peat forming in these forest environments, this is interpreted as forests, this is the time it took forests to rebound after the extinction. So this lake recovery timing seems to line up. We have evidence that lakes were recovering by 10 million years around the same time that oceans were doing it and around the same time that forests were doing it, which refines our understanding of how long it took global ecosystems to bounce back after the Permian extinction. Very cool. I like this because th this is a very nice example of finding similar data. Like most of what they found, at least to my layman's understanding, isn't like, oh my goodness, this, this brand new piece of information about after the extinction, but it is a new location where we're finding matching similar data. So it's showing that what we were seeing in other places is more consistent, even in other environments, which I like. I like that it's a affirmation from a rare source. Yeah. 
And it's, you know, it tells us what different habitats we're doing. And mm-hmm. does not surprise me that it seems at least ha- different habitats were recovering at a similar rate because mm-hmm. none of them exist in a vacuum. Exactly. I would expect that your global biodiversity is keeping rough pace in different habitats. Yeah. But it's nice to confirm when you finally get to actually study one of these ancient lakes. It is, it is. Also, ancient lake. Cool. Ancient lake. Uh, that was a really cool Diddy Kong Racing level. So, <laughs> speaking of mass extinctions, <laughs> let's move on to our main course and talk about an even older mass extinction after this short break. Extinction is the total disappearance of a clade, species, order, family, phylum, whatever, leaving no descendants behind. And it happens all the time. Yes, constantly. We talked about that in episode 55. There is a background extinction rate that comes out to, yeah, every year you're losing species. Yeah, sometimes more constantly than others, but constantly. Mass extinction are times where lots of extinction happens within a a relatively short period of geologic time for what appears to be a shared reason or set of reasons. In a landmark paper in the early 80s, I believe, a couple of paleontologists published an analysis of biodiversity through geologic time and found five times that biodiversity plummeted. Those became known as the Big Five Mass Extinctions. Now, we have since learned that there have been lots of mass extinctions of varying degrees. The Big Five aren't the only ones. They're not the most significant ones necessarily, but they are super famous. They include the worst mass extinctions we know about, and each one appears to have wiped out something like 70% or more of species. Which is, that percentage is always and will always be ridiculous that is too many species that's so much of what is alive on earth (laughs) we have done episodes on four of the big five and we've actually done them in reverse order just they were requested in reverse order yep the end cretaceous episode five the end triassic episode 15 the end permian episode 45 the end devonian episode 65 but the earliest of them happened at the end of the ordovician period that's what we're doing today. The last of the big five. Well, and also the first yeah, of the big five. I was about to say, the first It's actually last... the first one. This one is interesting for a number of reasons, but before we can really appreciate loss, we have to understand what was there to be lost. So let's meet the Ordovician period. Now, before I talk about the Ordovician, I have to talk about uh, its brother, the Cambrian. Yeah. In episode nine, we talked about the Cambrian explosion or perhaps the Cambrian radiation. Will, care to refresh our listeners on the Cambrian explosion? So the Cambrian explosion is a period in which we see a huge increase in the diversity of not only species, but forms of life. The different body designs that we now know today and are so familiar with, many of them got their start, or at least their earliest fossils show up during this time where for a period of history, we thought life must have started because of how ridiculously the (laughs) number in fossils increased during this time. The Cambrian radiation set the stage for not just the Cambrian period, not just the Paleozoic era, but the Phanerozoic Eon, Mm -hmm. which is a period of time that continues to this day. Yes. (laughs) But what fewer people might recognize is that 40 to 50 million years after the Cambrian explosion, there was another biodiversity explosion in the Ordovician. This is known as the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, which is probably why it's not as famous as the Cambrian yeah, explosion. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that it's that band with a slightly less catchy title, but yep. just as good songs. <laughs> this is the Ordovician's Cambrian explosion cover band. <laughs> this went on throughout the Ordovician period. And like the Cambrian radiation, just a huge diversification of all sorts of different life. The Ordovician, the the early to middle parts of the Ordovician, experience the highest levels of biodiversity in the Paleozoic era. This was just a ridiculous time for 
new forms of life following the Cambrian. The Ordovician period runs from about 485 to about 444 million years ago. And with all that diversification going on, this time period was full of a lot of our favorite Paleozoic creatures, trilobites, brachiopods, so brachiopods, and I'm going to define them because we're going to talk about them a lot, <laughs> are not bivalves. Yes. Like clams, oysters, mussels, or bivalves. Brachiopods are a different group, a wholly different group of very similar shelled animals. Yeah, still two shells, still hinged, but different origin. The Ordovician Seas rises in corals. A lot of echinoderms do really well starting here. Starfish, crinoids, things like that. You've got tons of graptolites and conodonts. So conodonts are early vertebrate relatives. Graptolites are these tiny little colonial creatures that make little tubes, very famous from the Paleozoic. Your dominant predators of this time in the swimming portion of the ecosystems are nautiloid cephalopods. Woo! You've got, and then of course you have your eurypterids and things like that crawling around. Reefs made of algae and sponges and those early corals. We also see early fish. So the starts of ecosystems as we recognize them ever since. Unlike every other mass extinction we've talked about on the podcast, this one occurred at a time where pretty much all life, or at the very least all recognizable life, through the fossil record, is in the water. Mm -hmm. We have not seen excursions onto land, at least not in a major way. There's hints that maybe things were on land so far at this point, but pr pretty much all life is in the oceans. Yeah, these established complex ecosystems were happening in the water. Now, the Ordovician is also interesting because it is a juxtaposition of the famous three evolutionary faunas. So this is sort of a classic definition of different types of marine ecosystems through time, which I believe was classified by Sepkoski, one of the guys that also did the biodiversity study that identified the big five. Cool. That was Raup and Sepkoski, and Sepkoski, I believe, also named the great evolutionary faunas. They are the Cambrian evolutionary fauna, the Paleozoic, and the modern. All right. The Cambrian evolutionary fauna is typified by things like trilobites, uh, early brachiopods, other bottom-dwelling organisms. There's lots of deposit feeders and grazers, so things crawling around, scooping stuff up off the floor of the ocean, in loosely structured communities. In the Ordovician, we have Cambrian evolutionary fauna, but it is on the decline. Okay. Because it is being supplanted by the Paleozoic evolutionary fauna. This is sort of the dominant ecological type on the rise in the Ordovician. This is dominated by suspension feeders. So you've got things like brachiopods, bryozoans, corals, crinoids. You have more structured communities, which is, for example, there's tiers of suspension feeding. Mm -hmm. So you've got like brachiopods and things on the floor, corals and stuff that are a little bit taller, and crinoids, which are your sea lilies, you kind of have this rainforest tiering thing going on. These are on the rise during the Ordovician and would go on to typify the rest of the Paleozoic. The modern evolutionary fauna includes lots of things like mollusks, bivalves, gastropods, mobile seafloor type critters. Mm -hmm. And in the Ordovician, we see the beginnings of it. Interesting. This evolutionary fauna doesn't become dominant until the Triassic. But in the Ordovician, we have all three in noticeable amounts. Cambrian on the decline, modern just starting to show up, and the origins of the domination of the Paleozoic evolutionary fauna. Which is a, it's a cool way to think about mm -hmm. your, your, your global ecosystem. You have different faunal types. And we'll talk more about it later. So yeah, the Ordovician is sort of, we're seeing the coalescence of ecosystems that will become familiar throughout the the remaining 500 million years of the Phanerozoic Eon. It's kind of neat to be able to see the in the beginning and the hints of major trends that partially defined huge portions of Earth-Ocean history. Yeah. That's cool. It's a trend in, in 
earth history studies that a lot of the sort of, you know, when you hear about the big five mass extinctions or trends in biodiversity over time, those tend not to be focused on dinosaurs and fish and Mm -hmm. trees. Mm -hmm. They tend to be on marine invertebrates. Well, and it's, it's like when we talked about grass where we can very clearly categorize the the section of earth history where grass became a major thing and it really has very little to do with the big animals eating it yeah like no no that's the reason this section is notable yeah there was grass now yeah yeah sure the things walking around those came and went but (laughs) grass grass lands yeah like the chapters of earth would be titled for things like plants and marine inverts oh yeah absolutely (laughs) Zooming out a bit from the life on Earth, the structure of the planet was also unique and interesting during this time. So the Ordovician was a time of generally high temperatures, generally high sea levels, high levels of of carbon dioxide, and the continental arrangement was interesting. For one thing, the Northern Hemisphere was mostly ocean. There was very little landmass in the Northern Hemisphere. Many continental masses were lined up uh, along the equator. So you had a lot of tropical land masses, including North America. And Gondwana, which we've already mentioned this episode, Gondwana is the ancient supercontinental amalgamation of today's southern continents, Africa, South America, Antarctica, Australia. That sort of close relationship between those continents goes back a very long time. Mm -hmm. So we had Gondwana in the Ordovician, and it was way south. In fact, at times it sat over the South Pole. Because of the high sea levels of the time, lots of these continental landmasses were flooded, creating what are called epicontinental seas. So if you think about your, your oceans today, most of the ocean is water that sits over oceanic crust, mm-hmm. which is very low-lying, and so your oceans are very deep. Along where the oceans meet the continents continental crust tends to protrude up higher and so you get continental slopes and shelves where the the crust is gradually rising toward the continent and those are shallower areas but they're still ocean shoreline an epicontinental sea or an inland sea is a flooded section of a continent yes so hudson bay is an example of this today Uh, i think the baltic sea is another example today those aren't ocean they are on the continent, but they are saltwater environments that are covering a section of continental landmass. The Ordovician was full of these. Tons of epicontinental seas, which is really great because those are great places for unique habitats to show up. Yeah, because now you actually can get sunlight all the way to the bottom. And they're, you know, slightly more isolated and you get all this cool endemic groups living in the epicontinental seas. A couple other things of note during the Ordovician. There's lots of continental uplift, including the rising of the ancient Appalachian Mountains, which rise and then go away and then come back again later, but that's another discussion. (laughs) And toward the end of the Ordovician, there is a period of glaciation, which we don't normally think about glaciation in the Paleozoic. Mm -hmm. There was a period of intense glaciation toward the end of the Ordovician centered on Gondwana, which was down at the South Pole. Why do I mention the severe glaciation that happened at the end of the Ordovician? No reason. (laughs) Just so you have context. On an unrelated note, let's talk about the extinction. At the end of the Ordovician period, there is a mass extinction. That's why we're here. The number you'll typically see associated with this mass extinction is 85%. An estimated 85% of marine species went extinct during this mass extinction event just ah. it also marks the end of the ordovician biodiversification event yeah i I would suspect it would so that was this pattern of diversifying and increasing abundance of species and such and then it ends with this big event i feel like a mass extinction is about the most abrupt way you can halt (laughs) (laughs) that'll do it (laughs) biodiversification event like (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no. Like our other mass extinctions, this was felt globally. 
two of the groups that are hit noticeably hard in this, that, that are, are famously discussed in this extinction, are trilobites and brachiopods. Oh. So trilobites are the sort of the bugs of the ocean back in the especially early Paleozoic. We yeah. talked about them in episode eighty two. Sectioned and armored. Little arthropod cre- they're they're cool. They're some of the coolest fossils. Trilobites see major losses, particularly in endemic groups, as opposed to widespread groups. Okay. Which is a trend you might expect. That the ones that are more restricted in where they live and what their habits are. You would expect those to be the animals that go extinct more than the more widespread, variously adapted Mm -hmm. groups. Brachiopods see similar trends, especially in those shallow seas, the the continental seas. They see lots of losses. Deepwater communities see lots of losses. And particularly a group called the inarticulate brachiopods, which were common in the Cambrian. Those are considered part of that Cambrian evolutionary fauna, and they got hit particularly hard during this extinction. We also see extinctions in crinoids, bryozoans, conodonts, ostracods, corals. I actually came across one reference that said that... So corals come in in colonial growth patterns and solitary growth patterns. Yep. So colonial means you have lots of coral animals growing together. Solitary is one at a time. One of the papers I read said no solitary corals survived the extinction. <laughs> Which, yeah. If you were caught by yourself, they pop up later. Mm-hmm. You know, new solitary coral forms evolved later. But that life strategy of coral was not a good thing to be during this extinction. Which is, it's fascinating when stuff like that happens where we can effectively completely lose a life strategy and for it to come back later in the same group. Yeah. Like, that's... It's, it's just a good way to be, except... Except... <laughs> when, when, when the world is in. When, yes, exactly. <laughs> during Armageddon, then it's less than ideal, but how often do those happen? Right, yeah, yeah. So you're pretty, perfectly fine. Graptolites, which, again, you may never have heard of, but little growing tubes in their little colonial things, super popular among invertebrate paleontologists because they're really cool. In the order of vision, they're great index fossils. Graptolites end up reduced mostly to the tropics, which is a trend a lot of animals we see, a lot of movement toward the tropics during this extinction. Mm -hmm. Reduction in the northern and southernmost areas. And I read read two papers that estimated how low graptolite diversity got. One said less than 20 species. I don't know if that is that we know of or like it is estimated that this is how low they got. And an earlier one, so it might be a more outdated uh, number, said six. <laughs> so Graptolites went down, they got hit real hard. Slightly more than a handful. Another group that got hit really hard, similarly, were the Nautiloids. Aww. So the Nautiloids are cephalopods, yeah. so squid, octopus, gnaw, cuttlefish cousins. The famous ones are, you know, the big straight-shelled Nautiloids that were dominant predators in the Ordovician. These... One source I read described them as going from around 300 species during the height of the diversification event down to less than 50 species during the late Ordovician. Oh. It was a tough time. Noticeably, the reference that I read said that nautiloids, there's hints that the endemic species did better than the widespread species. So the opposite of what I pointed out for trilobites and brachiopods. Weird. Species that were specific to a certain habitat or region might have done better than the ones that were more widespread. Which can make sense. Because even though we just explained why it makes sense the other way, it can make sense this way too. Because if you're specialized for something, though that means if that thing changes, you're potentially more vulnerable. It also means you have a competitive edge if it doesn't change yeah like if you're really good at this one thing and that one thing stays constant no one can push you out of that slot because no one's better at it than you yeah so being specialized is not always a bad thing that yeah just absolutely usually they suffer more during big extinction events but if you're if whatever situation they were living in didn't get shook up too bad makes sense oh yeah well it's it's like um 
uh, I keep trying. I keep thinking of like zombie apocalypse movies <laughs> and like the the weirdo who stockpiled guns and was following all the conspiracy theories and stuff mm-hmm. turns out to be well prepared for that fictional apocalypse. No. Well, it, what it also makes me think of is like you know we we don't well today's scenario actually matches this, but for zombie apocalypse, like you know, the one person who knows medicine, everyone wants to survive. Yeah. right <laughs> they that may be the only thing they're good at <laughs> yep you're, but we, you're, you're a doctor and nothing else we need you to keep being that <laughs> one thing it's yeah so being specialized is not always a um is not always as big a gamble as it's often made to seem. Right. it can go both ways mm-hmm. now there are some interesting patterns uh of the extinction between the different types of evolutionary faunas so i mentioned them before the Cambrian, the Paleozoic, and the modern style marine evolutionary faunas. The Cambrian evolutionary fauna suffered, based on uh, estimates that I came across, around 45% of families were lost. All right. Families. That's bigger. That's a, that's a big, <laughs> that's a much bigger group than species. So yeah, that's well, it's... the difference between house cats and dogs and wolves and felids and can't like that's the difference between black bears going extinct and bears going extinct exactly like the it's it's always a little weird when you go from like a percentage of species to a percentage of families because the, the percentage is much lower on the family side but it means you're losing entire groups yeah does each of that percentile portion of that percentile represents an entire group of life that just went yep and that's scary so the cambrian evolution suffers big losses all or most of the cambrian trilobite groups disappear and a lot of the ordovician groups are hit hard too but we see particular losses in the ones that were popular in the cambrian especially uh deep water forms and planktic forms oh like in the in the trilobites episode we talked about the agnostids Mm -hmm. which are Maybe, maybe not actual trilobites, but they're very similar to trilobites, which are thought to have been in the water column floating around like yep. plankton. That kind did very poorly in this extinction. We lost a lot of them. Bummer for the trilobites. The Paleozoic evolutionary fauna, which is the one on the rise at this time, loses about 30% of families. Still a lot. And the modern evolutionary fauna is estimated to have lost about 5%. Yeah. of family diversity now those at this time are a smaller part of global ecosystems they're mostly in shoreline or near shore environments but yeah there there is an interesting pattern it's we call this foreshadowing yeah right <laughs> <laughs> uh there are a lot of losses still especially in those near shore environments although i did find a reference that said gastropods so snails and mm-hmm. stuff did relatively okay i mean because they're snails i guess it was good to be a snail when isn't it good to be a snail? Like, <laughs> snails are everywhere. But overall, so lots of lost diversity, lots of species, lots of families, differences in different habitats and different lifestyles of who goes extinct. Sad, that's sad. But one of the things that really s- odd about the Ordovician in comparison to the other mass extinctions is that we are very accustomed to thinking of mass extinctions as dramatically reshaping what lives on the planet oh yeah you you take out a bunch of the pieces and you shake everything up surely it's going to fall out differently right the cretaceous mass extinction ended the reign of reptiles Mm -hmm. in the oceans on the land and then mammals took over afterwards the permian mass extinction ended the trends of the paleozoic and kicked off that reptile dominated global ecosystem of the mesozoic the Triassic is what allowed dinosaurs to take over, etc., etc. You, you major groups disappear and then new groups fill in. Oh, it's the um the mid season and in season events in Game of Thrones. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. We've lost most of the Starks and now the Lannisters are on the rise. <laughs> the Ordovician is weird in that even though there was tons of diversity loss, few dominant groups disappear. Hmm. The groups that are dominant after the Ordovician extinction are broadly the same as were dominant beforehand. Which kind of makes sense that, like, just by the sheer odds of 
lots of mass extinctions having happened in Earth's history, that at times, the ones who go extinct are not going to be the ones who open up all of the dominated you know niches and and habitats so yeah like it's weird <laughs> but it makes sense that like nothing guarantees these top uh, groups are going to have to be the ones that topple down yeah so and it, and it's also that you're not losing those major portions mm-hmm. like lots of brachiopods go extinct but brachiopods did not go extinct yes right like you lo- you lose a bunch of nautiloids but you, it's not the end of nautiloids well yeah it's like if we were to go around earth and wipe out half of ants we still have ants yeah ants are th- they're going to be different ants yes but they're still ants and they're still pretty much they're gonna be still going to be getting in your house doing they're what ants do still going to be invading your picnics <laughs> like yeah it's so that's interesting it's an interesting one and we'll talk more about that as as we get into the after yeah, yeah yeah of the extinction but the final point about the pattern of the extinction that i want to point out is that like some of the other extinctions we've mentioned, this does not appear to have been a single moment of extinction. Classically, this extinction is viewed in two pulses. So the very last stage, so the Ordovician period, 485-ish to 445-ish million years ago, is split into stages. The last of those stages is called the Hernantian stage. There is a pulse of extinction at the start of the Hernantian, and a second pulse of extinction at the end of the Hernanti. Okay. This was a two-step extinction event. Yeah, it's bookended by these pulses. Yep, and it, they happened about a million years or so apart, which geologically is very quick, yep. but noticeable in the fossil record. In between those two pulses is a unique set of communities. Ooh. So you have one pulse of extinction, and then there is this new set of life that starts taking over and then there's another pulse of extinction and the two extinction pulses affect different environments differently so the first extinction pulse is really rough in continental seas and deep oceans and the second extinction pulse is also bad in deep oceans but then also in near shore environments so you have two different extinction Types. Yeah, yeah, they they are those two extinction pulses are behaving differently. Yes, They're they affecting are. different things, and they add together to make the grand loss of of diversity in the Ordovician extinction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> where one didn't hit, the other one did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A one-two uh, punch, to use that phrase again. Also, that period in between where the the strange, you know, the, the odd si- environments and and groups succeeded or tried to succeed. That sounds like that sounds like a really cool narrative. Yeah, <laughs> like, like the Morlocks. Yeah, that I are would coming up out of the sewers. Absolutely, watch a TV show inspired by that. That starts immediately after the yeah. first pulse and it, ends with the second pulse. <laughs> some of them are called the Hernantian fauna. It is a unique fauna that pops up in there. That's really cool. Now I should point out that is the classic view of the Ordovician extinction: one pulse at the beginning, one pulse at the end. However, I did come across a number of papers that proposed challenges to this. I came across at least one that suggested that one of those pulses may be overestimated and that it was really just a one pulse thing and we're sort of misreading the data on the other one. Okay. And I came across at least one other study that suggested that it was more drawn out. And that it wasn't just two pulses, it was more gradual or several stages to the extinction. Yeah. So there is some discussion about exactly the pattern of extinction, but as far as I could tell in reading, the consensus view as of now, and the most common understanding of it, is that there was one pulse, two pulse, and that added up to the extinction. Mm -hmm. Just keep in mind that there is... it, It open for interpretation as more data comes in. I mean... As always with these extinctions, we will probably never get a truly clear view of what happened. Right. Because it's, it, it's, you know, it's that, that, I don't know if chaos theory actually applies here. Someone who <laughs> studies that would have to tell, but like, it's that concept of chaos theory is this is a global event and global systems are so insanely complex that you can't perfectly map them because there's too much. And this is our 
earliest really big famous one. Yeah. So which hey. which means that not only are we because the first paper I read about this was a two thousand one paper by by Sheehan said somewhere in the paper this is one this is possibly the best understood of the big five which on the one hand that's really cool because usually older things are less well preserved and harder to understand yeah we've lost our resolution but I also can't shake the thought that less resolution makes it easier for us to interpret an overly simplified version of events yeah I, that right now we have it is the best understood of the five because later on we will find out right, exactly. <laughs> that no it, it's not but for the purposes of this episode we will stick with the more classical understanding because it, again it seems to be the consensus <laughs> and neither of us are researching it yeah and i can't get into details <laughs> so Speaking of open questions and things we're still studying and, and the complexities of the extinction, let's talk about what happened to cause all this devastation after this quick break. After this word from our musical interlude. Yeah. <laughs> The question of what happened, why did this happen, is both <laughs> why why <laughs> is both why is both the most frequently asked and arguably most important question of any mass extinction. Yep, and possibly the hardest to answer. It's it's that like you said, it's a complex event. All of the Earth's processes are interconnected. Mm -hmm. It happens over millions of years, or at least hundreds of thousands. So it's tough. Yes, it's you're not able to look for and find the bullet casing, you know, or the the entry point. You're you're dealing with a massive event. Or it's over, pretty big. It's huge, and it is dealing with lots of organisms all of which might be going extinct for not exactly the same reason due to what's ha like so yeah you you don't have you don't have a smoking gun that said this is one of the few cases of a mass extinction where it seems if you ask experts most of them will point at the same thing cool that doesn't mean we know everything but we have a real good leading candidate right now there's a a, a decent consensus on what the most likely one is Early in the episode, I mentioned that the Ordovician ends with a period of intense glaciation. I remember that. Slightly later in the episode, I mentioned that there were two pulses of extinction generally recognized at the beginning and end of the Hernantian stage. I wasn't listening to that part. Well, that's what I said. Cool. They were listening. It's okay. You know what I'm talking about. Well, wouldn't you know it, the start of the glaciation is at the beginning of the Hernantian stage, and the end of the glaciation is at the end of it. Cool. The two pulses of extinction seem to line up with the start and end of this Ordovician Ice Age. Once again, there are some disputes that have mm -hmm. popped up on the exact timing of when things show up, but this seems to be a big deal. Leading candidate. When you read websites, if you Google Ordovician extinction, this is the first thing that'll pop up. Glaciers did it. The open questions then are... What exactly did the glaciation do to global ecosystems? And why was there such intense glaciation at this time? So let's get into that. Glaciation describes a event, a time period, where ice, glaciers, ice sheets, ice caps, are forming and spreading and taking over wide swaths of continental land. Things get cold, you get lots of ice, and that causes all sorts of havoc on the local and global ecosystems. Yeah, you can have cold areas of the planet, you know, the poles and tops of mountains, without being in an ice age. Glaciation is what really defines an ice age. You have, if you know, if not permanently, very regularly frozen sections of ice-covered area. Right. The, the, the ice is advancing. Yes. It has advanced to a place where it is significant. The evidence of glaciation in this period comes in large part from North Africa, where we find lots of geologic evidence of it. Tillites, moraines, and drumlins, which are, are various kinds of glacial deposits. We also get deposits in marine sediments. 
and we see striated rocks. So glaciers and ice sheets have scraped along these rocks. The same sort of evidence we see in the Pleistocene, you know, the, the Ice Age yeah. that we just got out of. Well, the geologically. important one. To yeah, us. the one that we, yeah, we care about. <laughs> all together, uh, all together, estimates that I've read suggest that we have evidence of an ice sheet in the South Pole centered on Africa. So this was Gondwana. There was no ice cap or ice sheet in the north because there were no continents up there. Yeah, it's harder to freeze when you don't have land. Evidence of an ice sheet over 6,000 kilometers long and possibly 30 million square kilometers in area. Jeez. For comparison, that's about three-fifths the extent of the Pleistocene ice cap, which was uh, largely northern ice age. This ice cap seems to have covered uh, at least part of, maybe a lot of, Africa and South America. We don't know how thick it was, but it was very extensive in its coverage. And there's evidence of ice caps moving as far as 60 degrees south latitude. Once again, for comparison, in the Pleistocene, the very recent ice age, northern ice caps extended to about 50 degrees north latitude. So this is fairly comparable. Yeah, this is an extensive coverage. Yes, it is. It was the most intense glacial event of the Paleozoic era, and I've even seen a couple places that say that it might have been the most intense glaciation of the Phanerozoic. Wow. But again, eh, a lot of resolution. Yeah, it's a tall claim. Which is to say that it was one of the worst uh, glacial things that wasn't a snowball earth. <laughs> that's, that's another way to put it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the spreading of glaciers and ice caps can have a number of impacts on the world, on global ecosystems and habitats many of which have been suggested as what may have led to uh, uh, some of these extinction patterns. One, very obviously, is uh, cooling temperatures, which can be both a cause and an effect of glaciation. <laughs> Good point. So as things get colder, obviously you're more likely to get ice and snow and the spreading of ice, but also as ice and snow cover spreads, not only do they contribute to a colder environment, so ice and snow are more likely to form near ice and snow because it's cold. But also ice and snow have a very high, what's called albedo. Yes. Which means they're very reflective. Mm -hmm. And so when sunlight comes down and hits ice, instead of being absorbed, like it is often in forests and oceans and such, a lot of that energy is bounced back, light and also heat. The farther your ice spreads, the less heat you're keeping from the sun, the colder things get. You can get this domino effect. This positive feedback loop. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite of what we're having nowadays, where as we are losing polar ice and more sea surface seawater is being exposed, it is absorbing more sunlight, which is speeding up the melting, which is exposing more water. Yep. So you can have it both ways. As your reflection increases or as your absorption increases, it can magnify whatever effect you're experiencing at the time. The other thing that glaciation can do on that same line is that glaciation, as we'll discuss in a second, is usually associated with lowering sea levels. And as the sea retreats, you expose sandy shores, mm -hmm. which also have a high albedo. Which makes sense. So cooler environments can certainly affect habitats and ecosystems. And indeed, as I hinted at before, there's a lot of evidence from this time that a lot of animal life, a lot of groups move toward the tropics, that the higher latitudes, north and south, are becoming harsher to live in. And so things are fleeing towards the warmer areas. The equator really is our safety belt. In... Except when it gets real hot. Yeah, no, true. <laughs> then it's the true. opposite. <laughs> then everybody runs. Yep. And the snakes get real big. <laughs> the second change that is implicated as possibly one of the most significant effects is that sea level drop. Lowering sea levels are associated with glaciation because glaciers are made of water. And that has to come from somewhere. And so as your water cycle is constantly, you know, evaporating, con condensing, running off into the ocean, more and more of that water gets caught freezing into the ice sheets and not going back to the ocean after evaporating, so your sea levels tend to lower. In 
geologic strata all around the world at this time, we see a regression, which is to say lowering sea levels. Estimates suggest that it could have been up to 100 meters of drop in sea level, comparing to the Pleistocene again, the most recent Ice Age, where estimates are around 100 to 150. So a similar degree of sea level drop as Mm -hmm. our most recent Ice Age. This is bad news for shoreline environments, because your shoreline is moving. Yes. The place where it used to be, you know, I was, oh, happily 50 meters under the ocean, so my reef or whatever, is now 50 meters above the ocean. Yeah, the surface is coming to get you. So everything has to shift around, but it's especially bad for those wonderful widespread continental seas. A continent can only be flooded if the sea level is high enough to flood it. Yes. So whereas the shorelines are moving and animals and ecosystems have to change, shift to keep up with it, epicontinental seas are disappearing. Yes. And like I said before, we see major ecosystem losses in those continental seaways. The habitats are disappearing. They're shrinking. You are actually losing space for those organisms to live in. And the third major impact of glaciation that is often hinted at is changes to ocean circulation. So this can happen because of changing temperatures can be related. It can happen because of the way that glaciers interact with the ocean. There's also some suggestion that tectonic movement at this time may have affected ocean circulation. Mm -hmm. But the upshot of all that is that you get changes in the strength and movement of your currents. And there is evidence at this time that oceanic currents were becoming stronger and mixing more as this glaciation set in. One of the big sort of signs of the the, the impact of that is that in deep water environments, whereas you previously had these lovely black shales, which are evidence of low oxygen environments, those start to become overlain by gray shales, oxygenated sediments, more fossiliferous, which might sound good. Mm-hmm. Hooray, we've, there's more oxygen being mixed down to those lower yeah, ecosystems. I, I love oxygen. But as we discussed in episode 75, oxygen's only good if you're adapted to survive with lots of oxygen. Yes. And those deep water habitats were home to a lot, like graptolites and things that were adapted to low oxygen environments. Yes. So when the mixing happened, you get major losses in your deep ocean ecosystems. The way I always think about the ocean currents thing, because it it can often be kind of a a hard thing to grasp because you can't see ocean currents. Like, it's all just water. Right, right. And it's all, it's chemical is what... Although you should look up maps of ocean circulation because it's so cool. It's fascinating. And what it's causing that mixing is changing where nutrients and chemicals are going in the concentrations... It always makes me think of if you suddenly scrambled the the weather formations on land. Like, if suddenly you took the amount of rain we get here in the southeast and moved it over toward the, the middle of Texas or Arizona and replaced their rainfall here, our ecosystem would wither, theirs would flood. Yep. Like... The rain would be like, yeah, more rain's good, right? N- not if you don't have a place for it to go. Right, not if you're a desert. Yeah, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's going to flood and drown your plant. So, like, that's kind of what's happening, but in an oceanic chemical setting. Yeah, exactly. And not only are your chemical, you know, your oxygen and sulfur levels and stuff changing, but that change in circulation changes where nutrients go. Yeah, where once this coast used to be great to live on because nutrients just got poured in here, suddenly that gets diverted. Yep. And you're in an oceanic desert. And then somewhere else might get an overabundance of nutrients, which can lead to toxic blooms. Yeah, algae blooms. Algal blooms and stuff where there's this burst of, of life taking advantage of all these nutrients and they suck all the oxygen and nutrients yep. out of the water. And now it's a desert too. Yes. So onset of glaciation, sea levels drop, ocean circulation changes, the world is a bit of a mess. This seems to make sense as the main driver of the first pulse of this extinction. And indeed, though, especially in the deep water ecosystems, where you now have this new system, this, this new condition, this new setting in your deep ocean, 
you get new communities popping up. That Hernantian fauna are lot you know lots of things like trilobites and brachiopods that are forming communities adapted to those cold water, fairly good with oxygen perhaps, deep water ecosystems. Which is cool because it means that that little section, that fauna, was not necessarily... I mean, it wasn't, wasn't, but it wasn't necessarily just the organisms that tried to bounce back. It was the ones who actually were doing better. Yeah. During this weird time. They adapted to this new normal that was down there. Yeah. And semi-flourished. I don't know how much they flourished, but... They, they seem to have done pretty well, actually. Yeah, came up, and we're doing great until... And then the second pulse. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the Hernantian, the glaciation ended. Which means climate got warmer again, sea levels rise... And circulation in the ocean appears to return largely to normal. And now, the second pulse did not hit continental ecosystems very hard, because there weren't a lot of them left. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, they lost their habitat. But a lot of a lot of those deep water ecosystems declined for the same reason as before. Yes. You adapted to this wonderful new ecosystem, and then it went away. It switched back, and now what you had adapted to... Was what it was. <laughs> yep, it's not there anymore. This this makes me think of those moments in those the, the zombie apocalypse movie or whatever, where you have the the guy who was doing great in the apocalypse. Oh and yes, then it's over. Yeah, and now he has to learn how to live in society again. It's the the action hero thing of trying to show an action hero after the the last movie. Yeah, uh, or you know, we were watching Bond. It's what they did with Bond after the Cold War. It's yeah, like, now what do you do? Now I don't. I don't. <laughs> I have nothing to use these skills on. This was an actual Cold War. Like the, the waters <laughs> got colder, and then a new community of organisms <laughs> set up. <laughs> I'm here all week and for a long time because there's a pandemic out there. <laughs> Another major ecosystem that was affected this time was the shelf environment. So near shore environments on the the continental shelf. And one thing that has been implicated here is that that shift in, uh, in in ocean circulation, it was now moving waters that had become oxygen poor and sulfur rich and such Ooh. up onto the shore. That yeah yeah. So it's it's not that that's how they would stay, but there was a sudden influx, perhaps perhaps of potentially toxic water to the organisms that are living there that, yeah that makes sense so you have so the glaciation seems to be this one and then the next two pulses the world got hit by the first pulse the second pulse hit the parts that weren't hit the first time and then hit one of the one some parts again yeah now like i said some of the specifics are still being researched and i've seen papers that are kind of challenging exactly how did this chemistry change did was the anoxia right o uh, oxygen poor water was that more of an effect the second pulse or the first pulse mm -hmm. but the, these impactors seem to be a major uh, driver of this extinction and a lot of sources i read pointed out that it was a short glaciation mm -hmm. under a million years which meant that there was little time for organisms to adapt bef during or in between. Yes. That's, yeah, no, if, if those other faunas had been able to diversify and become very stable, maybe they would have done better when the ecosystem shifted again. It was a rapid series of events that really caused a lot of damage. Which, to me at least, makes sense both on how that would cause such a mass extinction because it was this sudden you know two pulses of extinction but sudden pulse of glaciation just things froze and then they thawed and not with enough time for anyone to adjust yeah but also that makes sense to me why you didn't see necessarily a huge shift in the overall ecosystem setup before and after because a lot of the other mass extinctions we discussed were either seemed to happen at a point where global conditions changed and then stayed different after the change. Like, we see a shift here and then things are that way for the foreseeable future for a bit. This was just a little boop 
And then it went back to what the survivors were still good at. So it makes sense that things would have you know, not returned to normal, but would have continued kind of as normal after things thought out. Yeah. No, it, it does make some sense. On both sides, which is, it's an odd extinction. Now, one of the big questions is if glaciation was a main driver of the extinction, why was there such an intense glaciation? Yes. Now, like I said, once glaciation starts, once ice caps start to spread, they tend to get carried away. It's it's that Looney Tunes snowball downhill. Yep, and an actual snowball. Cold temperatures, albedo from ice and exposed seafloor. But there have been a couple of suggestions of how it may have gotten started. One is that ocean circulation may have started changing before glaciation set in, just because of movement of the continents. Yeah. Which could have shifted nutrient abundances, which could have caused blooms of algae and life. And then when they die, you get a lot of burial of organic material, which traps carbon down in the seafloor sediments. Yes. And okay. if your carbon is trapped away, it's not being recycled back into the atmosphere. And it's not greenhouse gassing. So your CO2 levels tend to drop. If that was a driver of this glaciation, it could be that later when the ocean circulation changed again, either again because of glacial impacts or tectonic impacts, you get the reverse. Mm -hmm. That that pattern goes back to what it was before. Another suggestion is weathering. So this is a thing that I, I, I think surprised the heck out of me when I first learned it. Yes. The weathering of rock, the chemical process of weathering when rain and wind interact with exposed rock, absorbs carbon dioxide. Like Which the weathering is... of silicate rocks mm -hmm. absorbs carbon dioxide as part of the chemical process. Which is super weird to think about just because typically when you think of weathering, you think of like, you think of like water washing away a... a river bank right right or, yeah it was just and that is erosion and that's the physical process of it weathering is also this very chemical oriented process which is something i don't think most of us i know i didn't before learning that we don't think about weathering as that you know weathered stones are often just shown as these like wind beaten and rain beaten rocks but chemical stuff is happening yeah. if you remember your chemistry class the equation must be balanced it must be balanced as all things should be <laughs> and so carbon dioxide ends up getting pulled out of the atmosphere for this so because there was lots of mountain building during this time mm. exposing lots of new rocks you end up with lots more weathering that could be pulling carbon out of the atmosphere decreasing co2 this is something that's also been suggested for the Cenozoic. Uh, the Himalayas yeah, yeah. are thought to be linked to the cooling trend in the Cenozoic for a very similar reason. Which is, the, and this goes back to what we were saying earlier of like... Now that that's the, 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 essence, the essence of chaos. Nobody could have predicted that the Appalachian Mountains that would suddenly... That mountains <laughs> could wipe Caused out... glaciation. 45% of families. Like, yep. That it's those kinds of things where there are just so you know these chemical processes are going on globally all the yep. time. So if one just ticks slightly over over a percentage or in the wrong way, the domino effect can have oh yeah just un unspeakable effects on life. The the way that I had a geology professor in undergraduate who he didn't put it quite this way, but the the way he was trying to get across <laughs> was. Uh, if we're correct about all those impacts and such, the rise of the Himalayas is the reason that we now have lots of horses and wildebeests and yeah. deer and stuff. Yeah. Because cold climates, weathering, drawdown CO2, caused cooling, led to the spread of grasslands, led to the adaptation of animal life as we know it. And then, if, again, if that was an impactor driving the, the onset of glaciation in the Ordovician, a suggestion for why it ended was that if, as the ice caps spread, they would have covered up those rocks. <laughs> so Gondwana's down on the South Pole with all this mountain building going on, and then it becomes covered in ice, and now you're not getting weathering anymore. Uh, the, the glaciers spread too too wide and too greedily. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they covered up something in the darkness. <laughs> now, 
Glaciation is, like I said, the big sort of leading contender. But there are a few other things that'll get named as possible suggestions for related to the uh, Ordovician extinction. And the big secondary one, you will, if you've listened to our other four mass extinction episodes, you will not be surprised to hear this. Uh-huh. Volcanoes. Ah. Our, our old friend Our returned. old friend return. <laughs> well, our old friend begins. <laughs> There is some evidence from various different sources, including uh, chemical isotopes and such, of intense volcanic activity starting perhaps during the Catian stage, which is the one before the Hernantian. And there's even been some suggestion that the volcanic activity might have been a large igneous province. Yeah. Would it be an episode ending in five? <laughs> if we didn't talk about large igneous provinces. So large igneous provinces, if you've, li- again, we've mentioned it, I think every extinction, mass extinction Just, episode. Yep. Because they are often implicated, are volcanoes gone ridiculous. Yes. Huge, very, very long lasting, extensive volcanic activity. Now, volcanoes obviously can wreak havoc with the ecosystems and there have been some people who have suggested that volcanoes may have been a partial driver or even the driver Mm -hmm. of the extinction because they release various gases into the atmosphere they can cause acidification of waters they can create anoxic events in waters and stuff because suddenly tons of chemicals that were locked in the earth are just brought out to play and all those toxins are coming out yep not everyone's ready But others have pointed out that volcanic activity can also affect glaciation. So, of course, the release of CO2 from uh, from volcanoes can cause warming, Mm -hmm. which can impact the ending of glacial periods. Well, and also all that hot lava. Hot lava. And yeah, then it's hot. Yeah. But also, volcanoes form rock. Yes. And so you can get more rock for more weathering. Now, uh, one description that I read described the suggestion that if this volcanic activity started earlier, then for a while, while the volcanoes were active, they would have been releasing lots of gases and producing lots of surface area for weathering, which would have balanced out carbon production and carbon consumption. But once the volcanoes stopped outgassing, they are no longer producing new carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but all that rock is now being weathered away, absorbing CO carbon from the uh, atmosphere. So it could be that the ending of volcanic activity triggered some of the patterns that led to the start of glaciation. Cool. So there's all sorts of cool interactions between different parts of the of 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 the the global ecosystem Mm -hmm. um so it seemed this this one feels to me very much like the end cretaceous where we have a thing yes at the end there is an asteroid and it hits at the same time the extinction happened here there is a glacial event in it corresponds with the two evident pulses of the extinction seems to be sort of the a good easy case and then there's other things that could be exasperating it, that could be contributing to it. I've seen some suggestions of... I, I saw at least one paper that was suggesting that it was volcanoes. Mm-hmm. That the glaciers, the glaciation was inconsequential. Which always seems a little bit like with the, the Cretaceous, where people are like, what if it was this? And I'm like, right, but we there was an asteroid. It happened at the extinction. Yes. And that seems to be the general consensus glaciers ice age and then maybe some other stuff involved alongside another thing i came across a paper and it's also mentioned in the wikipedia article (laughs) so for those of you who go to wikipedia you'll see this uh with another thing that i think has been implicated for every extinction ever yep supernova (laughs) (laughs) yeah there's a paper about gamma a possible gamma ray burst Mm -hmm. that may have irradiated the earth and weakened the ozone and whatever And I have nothing to say about that, except that I don't, I rarely see that come up in the papers that I read. And it seems like we have what we need to explain this extinction. 
I'm open to see what more comes out. Yes. Maybe maybe we'll uh, we'll learn and I'll, and I'll be proven wrong. Well, and I I actually don't know, so I'd love if anyone out there does. I'll I'll do my searching, but if someone knows quicker, let me know. I don't know because I've I've heard that proposed for multiple extinction events. Sometimes even just like small scale extinction events. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't know if that's ever been solidly accepted. Not to my knowledge. I don't think so. And I think a lot of the reason for that, at least it seems to me uh, as not a researcher of these things. Yes. Part of that seems to be that the people doing those are often disconnected from the people who are more typically studying those extinctions, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which can mean both that if it's a bunch of astronomers trying to contribute, they're publishing in a different place. They're working with different people and it's not being part of the general discourse about it. Yeah. Which can both mean that the evidence they're providing is not getting to the consensus people, the you know, the people who are doing most of the studies, but also that they might not be they might be missing important information because yeah. they're not part of those groups of, of researchers. Yeah. So it all it always seems a little bit outside and then just doesn't really get picked up. Yeah, and circulated within those research groups. Exactly. That's that's the way I've always heard it. Is where like I'll be reading about it, and then they'll just be like, "Yeah, and maybe this," but uh, then it just the conversation moves on. Right. Right. Uh But it, I feel like with these events, we also we have to be wary because it is very easy to get stuck in the was it the ice age or the volcanoes? Well, it probably doesn't work that way. No. Like they both happened and coincident were, with the extinction. Yeah, and they were both doing stuff they both had an effect regardless of what that effect was like yeah things don't happen in a bubble well it's like trying to identify the the reason a war started exactly it's like well yes you might be able to pin down a few inciting incidents and you may be able to say that this is when we officially say this war started but what caused that and what caused that and what caused that and right. what co- exactly and then you eventually get back to the first humans evolved. <laughs> like, well, and it's if would that have happened if not for this other yes. thing that was also happening at the same time? Nope. This person hadn't done that if the volcanoes hadn't been mm-hmm. there. And so, like we said at the beginning, it's very difficult to nail down the specific mechanisms of extinction. Yes. But this happens to be a, a case where we have some really good candidates that seem to point towards a if not simple, somewhat straightforward links. Seems to be a strong and obvious connection. Now, no discussion of mass extinction is complete without a touch on what happened afterwards. The epilogue. The epilogue, yes. In the post-apocalyptic landscape of the early Silurian period, how did life do? We talked in the news about recovery after the Permian extinction well, the Silurian was started out as a period of recovery. Mm-hmm. Most references that I came upon while putting together resources for this episode cited that it is thought to have taken several million years for recovery to happen, which is not too dissimilar from the Permian, uh, although perhaps not quite as protracted. Mm-hmm. Although, again, I've seen some suggestions otherwise. I saw at least one paper that suggested we might be overestimating the recovery period that it may have actually been quicker yes and i saw another paper that suggested it may have been slower and that paper actually said that the entire silurian (laughs) may have been a recovery period from this event but again the consensus view the one that i saw most often seems to be several million years of recovery building back up to diversity and complexity of ecosystems similar to what was before Like I said earlier on, there was lots of extinction in this uh, event, but few lost clades, few lost higher taxa. A lot of the change was readjustments in ecosystems rather than lost ecosystems. Yeah. So for a few examples, a lot of brachiopods were lost. Some groups declined quite a bit, but afterwards the brachiopods that came back went back to being dominant members of their ecosystems with similar roles, Mm -hmm. similar with uh, nautiloids, so the cephalopod predators. Lots of loss, at least one entire order of nautiloids died out. 
but by the mid-Silurian, they appear to be top predators again. Yay! And diverse again. Reefs were hit very hard by the extinction event, but then similar reef communities were able to pop up again during the Silurian. So, and we talked about this a bit before, this seems to be a case where ecosystems were hit hard, but not fundamentally changed afterwards. Mm -hmm. And one of the suggestions I came across in a reference for why this may have been was the suggestion that a lot of keystone species may have survived. That would make sense. So the species that are critical to the way environments function may have persisted and were able to restore a dynamic like there was before. Yeah, these are animals today that you often will see used as examples for keystone or like elephants and beavers that are shaping and molding the environment around them or providing a particular resource right. to the if environment. You remove beavers from North America, a lot of your freshwater ecosystems would change yep. dramatically. Suddenly your wetlands look completely different. Elephants move a lot of nutrients and they clear a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And if you removed them, that's going to have a big impact. But if you had a mass extinction in North America and beavers survived, your habitats might mm -hmm. end up going, staying fairly similar once diversity rebounds. I think a good way to look at it is that when you go from before the ice age to during the ice age, there were whole habitats that went away, you know, inland seas that just poof yep. they are gone now and there are places that are functioning fundamentally different because now there's oxygen where it shouldn't be or wasn't and so in those situations you can't just bounce back the same way because nothing's the same but afterward if things do bounce back to the way they were if there's inland seas all right well if there are survivors you were already good at that if yeah. the nutrients goes back to where it was, you are already adapted for that. So the stage is set. So as long as you have some key players that can go in and, and occupy it, it makes sense that things would have bounced back basically to where they kind of were. Yeah, yeah. Ish. Now, there were some longer lasting effects. For example, while the Paleozoic and evolutionary fauna, the, the groups typical of the Paleozoic, did recover during the Silurian, the Cambrian evolutionary fauna did not recover well. And they continue to be on their way out. Yeah. That shapes the rest of the Paleozoic. Uh, we ta I talked about how reefs bounce back. Corals bounce back. Woo! Now, in the Paleozoic, there are two dominant type groups of corals. The tabulates, which often have these cool hexagonal, like honeycomb shapes. Geometric. To them. And the rugos, which are your horn corals. Mm-hmm. In the Ordovician, tabulates were the dominant corals. But after the extinction, rugos become the dominant corals and stay that way the rest of the Paleozoic. Still corals, still reef builders, still doing the same sorts of things, but which group is in charge has changed. I feel like this is like when companies buy out another company <laughs> and like yep. us, the consumer, basically can't tell because we still are getting the product. But right. if you look at the bottom, there's a different label. <laughs> right, yeah. No, some, somewhere there's like a group of brachiopods that are really annoyed because that movie was made by Sony and not yeah. Marvel. <laughs> and yes. An, <laughs> and another change that was really interesting that I, I, I read on is I mentioned that during the extinction, there was a broad pattern of, and a lot of groups, endemic taxa, which is to say groups that were specific to certain habitats, did worse than cosmopolitan taxa, which is to say much more widespread groups, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to see in an extinction. We see that a lot. The more widespread you are, the more buffered you are against changing habitats. The Silurian was repopulated by widespread taxa, Again, perfectly reasonable. We see that after the Permian yeah. uh, noticeably as well. But the Silurian period, throughout the Silurian period, ecosystems largely seem to stay that way. Silurian ecosystems seem to be in large part populated by widespread organisms. Yeah. With comparatively little endemic groups popping up. Which is, uh, that's an odd way for things to be 
to to stabilize. Yeah. And so you you have less I don't want to say less specialization, but less of that regionalism in ecosystem mm-hmm. type. And then of course back to the beginning I mentioned the Ordovician biodiversification event, the Gobi, right? Great Ordovician mm-hmm. biodiversification event. Mm-hmm. This event interrupted it. And then when diversification sort of rose up again, did not quite achieve the same levels as before. And the rest of the Paleozoic has been described as a biodiversity plateau. Oh, yeah, yeah. Diversity went back up and then kind of stayed in one spot for a while. So this event marks the shift from the grand rising of diversification and then stabilization. Well, we were nervous. We've been hurt before. Right, exactly. (laughs) You know, we're not going to mess with the powers that be. (laughs) And then there were a few other... Uh, uh, patterns that I heard noted of where, how things recovered that I thought were really interesting. One is that since both the epicontinental seas and the deep oceans were hit really hard, it's been suggested that they were repopulated by nearshore faunas. Oh, okay. Which is apparently a trend we see throughout the Paleozoic, that near the shoreline species and groups moving into the continental and oceanic environments to populate new environments and stuff. That makes sense. That's cool. And then another, I saw one paper that that, that described the uh, role of sponges. <laughs> and I just thought this was so cool, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on this. Sponges during the extinction and, and uh, afterwards seem to dominate the benthic ecosystems. So, benthic living on the sea floor. Yeah, bottom. They seem to do, you know, comparatively well. And this paper points out that them doing okay and down on the sea floor may have allowed ecosystems to crop up there. They may have served as foundations. Yeah. Both figuratively, like, hey, we've started a, a an ecosystem down yes, here. Yes, we're living down here. The water's fine. But also literally foundations. Yeah, because they're sponges. Because they're sponges, so things could gr- they 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 are a substrate. Yes, like there are organisms and animals that specifically live in sponges, <laughs> and sponges like trees stabilize the sediments on the floor. Uh, yeah. So other organisms can live nearby without having to worry about loose sediment, and the paper even suggests that this might have been an explanation for a what they interpret as a comparatively rapid recovery and they compared it to the permian where sponges didn't do okay and it recovery seems to have taken longer oh wow and i think that sort of harkens back to that comment about keystone species Mm -hmm. if the right groups survive then certain types of ecosystems will be able to rebound more readily and more quickly. Yes. And so it's a cool, this is an odd extinction for that reason. Well, it's, it's, I like it because at least from what we've gone over and from the, the current understanding that we've looked into, it makes sense how that could happen. It stands out because that's not what typically happens when we, study extinctions right and it's not what you expect it's not what seems like would be the the most likely outcome but nothing about it is impossible just improbable and that's cool because once again just statistically it seems like we should have an extinction like this considering how long things have been going extinct in mass quantities and i think the the sponge comparison is also a really good one because what goes extinct matters. Yeah. Like big time, you know, if for some reason the archosaurs hadn't been hit as hard at the end of the Cretaceous, we'd be looking at it. It's not like mammals would have dominated the way they have. Anyway, we'd be looking at a very different world. Oh yeah. Well, and we, we've talked about how at the end of the Pleistocene, the mammoth step biome goes away. Exactly. Partially because it depended on mammoths. Yeah, you needed those bulldozers shifting things around. Well, it's like if we have a mass extinction like global event 
and we lose something. I'm going to go back to what I used before, but if grass gets ridiculously hit, say goodbye to herds. Oh, yeah. Like savanna, prairie, like those are ecosystems that uh, entire biomes that mm -hmm. will not exist if you lose that important component of them. While on the flip side, if grass sticks around and we lose 90% of grazing life, in a short time, there will be herds eating that grass again, almost really? guaranteed, because... They might not be the same things. They'll look different. They'll probably be different groups will have taken the, the spaces that others occupied. But if that habitat, that resource is still there, then all it needs is someone to take advantage of it to flourish. So yet, like, ex not all extinctions are the same. What goes extinct and how it happened really affects the overall picture. I really appreciate that each of the big five mass extinction episodes, I hope everybody can hear the quotation marks I put around big five. And <laughs> each of those teaches us different things. Yes. And it, it's really fun. If you haven't listened to the other big five, check them out. Uh, some of them were extremely early, and I'm sure we don't sound nearly as polished as we do today. We should uh, put them together on the blog post. Oh, no, these will all be linked in the yeah, blog post. So we should we should make a little category. As always, there will be links and images in the blog post. We have finished the big five. Yep. But 10 episodes from now will be another ni it'll be 95. Mm -hmm. So send in your suggestions for what extinction topics you want us to cover. Before we wrap things up for reals, we have a patron question. We do. Some of our patrons get the, the, the opportunity to ask us questions for us to answer on the podcast. Will? Yes. Would you like to read our question this time? I would. So, our question today is from Michael, who asks, In deposits like the Morrison Formation, where Jurassic Rock is exposed, does that mean that something happened to erode away all the rock deposits from the Cretaceous and younger, or does that suggest that there hasn't been significant rock deposits in that area since the Jurassic? Great question, and the answer is yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, d what rocks are exposed at the surface will depend on, as you're getting at, the geologic history. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is just that there hasn't been much deposition on top since the Jurassic or since whatever. Other times it is that there has been erosion. So a great example is here in the southern Appalachian Mountains, the rocks around us are early Ordovician. Very old. Like older than the extinction we just talked about. Yes. <laughs> One of the reasons that they're exposed here is because uplift, the mountains have lifted lots of rock and expose them to weathering. Yeah, very aggressive weathering. So if there were overlying sediments on top of this, a lot of those have been eroded away. And also now it's on a mountain, so you're not getting a lot of new deposition, right? Deposition tends to happen in low-lying areas. So mm -hmm. next to mountains tends to be a great place for new deposition because all the stuff coming off the mountain. Oceans and lakes and stuff tend to be really good. In the middle of the United States, a lot of our depositional exposures are oceanic, mm -hmm. Cretaceous from the Western Interior Seaway that we discovered in episode seventy, uh, discussed in episode seventy-one, because you had this great environment for deposition, and then after that, you were left with broad plains. And in a lot of those places, there hasn't been a lot of deposition since then to cover those up. Yeah. Now, I honestly, I will admit, I do not know the geologic history of the regions where the Morrison Formation is exposed, so I can't speak specifically to them. But the answer is that it's a, often a combination of those factors. Either there hasn't been a lot of lasting deposition, or if it's in an erosional environment, like on a mountain or in the northern parts of North America, where glaciers very recently <laughs> scraped away the surface, you'll get exposures because of recent, more recent erosional and weathering effects clearing away the overlying sediment. As with so many things, it's often a complicated back and forth of things. I think it can often be kind of tricky to really grasp because many people understand the whole concept of 
the deeper the layer of rock, the older it is. But usually when that's taught or displayed, it's showing like a like book pages perfectly stacked. Like the Grand Canyon. Like the Grand Canyon. And that the areas do exist that have that, but that's not common and it's not uniform. Rocks, as you were saying, don't deposit uniformly across the surface. So you can have areas where it's like, it doesn't really matter how deep you dig here. You may never find rock from that age you're looking for. A lot of, um, the, a, a lot of the history of mountain building in the past is studied from the deposition of sediment eroding off the mountains. Yes. So you'll say this basin was a, was full of sediment being deposited, indicating a mountain next door. Yeah. And that's how we, oftentimes geologists will study ancient mountain building. That is a very good question, mm -hmm. Michael. Thank you for asking. Patrons, you feel free to ask us questions. Right now we have a big old list of patron questions. Yeah. So feel free to fill it up. If you're not a patron, hey, you know, think about it. Also, and, and we didn't say this at the beginning of the episode, and we should have, and maybe we'll say it next time. Huge thanks to patrons, not only in general, but also patrons who are sticking with us now. Yes. And who have been joining us recently. We... Uh... Uh, we always appreciate any patronage like it, it that means so much to us but during this time with the way things are it's incredible no so, we we know a lot of people are having financially difficult times right now we would not be surprised or upset no we, if, if people had to cut off patronage with us for 100 percent understand and so we are super appreciative that there are people continuing to contribute to us and join the patreon so thanks to our patrons yeah. keep an eye on the patreon for all sorts of new stuff thanks to all of our listeners if you haven't been checking out our bonusy things silver screen science and such check those out if yeah. that's your sort of thing like we said let us know if there's other kinds of bonus content you want to see if there's something we've done in the past that you'd really like to hear us do more of or if you have an idea for something you'd like to hear us do now's the time to ask also keep an eye on our social media in case we do other fun stuff yes like our netflix viewings and things like that like i said there will be a blog post with images and links so you can check out more stuff we release episodes every fortnight mm -hmm. pandemic or not yes so stay tuned for another couple of weeks we will have another episode come in your way stay safe stay healthy stay sane and stable good luck to everybody out there and thanks for listening thanks everyone Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.